Uh, good morning. My name is Paul Walker, and I serve as the teaching pastor here at The Meaning Place. And this morning, we are launching our brand new teaching series on Galatians. And you're going to learn a bit later why we're, we're in this series uh, later on in our gathering. But today, I just want to kind of cue up our special feature today. And our special feature today is that our scripture team behind me is going to be walking us through different sections of Galatians. You're going to hear this ancient letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. So before we begin, I just want to pray for us. So let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we would hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers and sisters with me. To the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which really is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we've preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we've already said so, I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it from re by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go to, up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Sicilia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I, I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet... Not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose only because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. 
For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ Jesus, not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For though through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again I ask, Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning uh, many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. 
But God, in his grace, gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions, until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. And a mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. It is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God. Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to the guardians and the trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. For the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, When you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You're observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I'm pleading with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to come under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The woman represents two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that above is free, and she is her mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman. You who never bore a child, shout for joy and cry aloud. You 
who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. At that time the son born, according to the flesh, persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command— Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the likes. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, then let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, You who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Each of you should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else for each each one should carry their own load. Nevertheless, the one who receives instruction in the word should share all good things with their instructor. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See, 
See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Well, hey, friends, why don't we show some love to our scripture reading team that just beautifully read Galatians Day for us. That was fantastic. It's not often that that you just read through a whole letter of the Bible, right? But that's how they would have received the letter. They would have sent a herald and someone would have read the whole letter at once. So we participated in something that it's something that was commonplace in the early church. So let me say that this past week, I was driving in my car with Olivia and Benjamin in the back seat, and we were driving to an appointment. And while we were on, my, on our commute to get there, the phone rang. Now, I have Bluetooth in my car, so I was able to hit answer, and I did. On the other end was someone from the church, and they were calling to ask me a question. And we had this quick conversation, and then I hung up the call. And while as soon as I hung up the call, part two of the conversation began because Benjamin and Olivia in the back seat were very curious about this interaction. They wanted to know who this mysterious person was, who was the voice booming through the speakers of our car. And we began part two of the conversation. I'm driving, but they're in the back seat hollering questions about what just happened. So Olivia says, Dad, who was that? And I say, Someone from the church. Olivia says, do I know them? I said, nah, I don't think you've personally met this person. Olivia says, do they know me? (laughs) And I say, I I don't, like, I think they do know you because I talk about you in church sometimes. Well, then it was silence. We keep driving. And about 30 seconds later, Benjamin pipes up from the back seat and he says, I think that means we're famous. <laughs> YouTube famous. I love that conversation. Uh, In fact, my favorite conversations I have with my kids are those discovery conversations where they lean in and learn about the world around them through questions. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you know these kinds of conversations. You might even call them interrogations because they're full of questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how. This is the language of parenting. Child psychologists tell us that the average child asks 300 questions a day. The average adult, 30. But questions are the way that that children orient themselves to the world around them. They're trying to understand this thing called life. And I think the same is true for adults, especially when we're in a new circumstance. We ask lots of questions we want to understand through inquiry and examination. And so today, we're in a new circumstance. We're in a new teaching series. And I briefly just want to look at a few questions to help us understand this world of Galatians. So we're going to look at the who, the where, the when, and most importantly, the why of Galatians. So let's start with who. Who wrote Galatians? Who's that? Well, verse 1 says this. Paul, an apostle. Paul wrote Galatians. And maybe that's too easy even to answer for you. Like maybe you're wondering, how can we really be sure he wrote it? If that's you, I'd encourage you to text in a question because there's all sorts of curious engagements through the world of textual criticism. If you want to know more about that, let me know and I'll answer it in Q&R. Next question, where is Galatia? Maybe you're planning your next vacation. 
Maybe. You're just wondering, where is this place on the map? Well, if you are planning your next vacation, you're going to be traveling a lot in southern Turkey because Galatia is not a city. It's actually a whole region in the Roman Empire. And this is curious because other Pauline letters tend to be written to cities, to the church in Rome, Ephesus, Philippi, Corinth. But here in Galatians, we uniquely have a letter that was circulated across a whole region uh, and network of churches. So verse 2, to the churches, plural, in Galatia. Again, this is in modern-day southern Turkey. And they're most likely the churches that Paul planted on his first missionary journey in Acts chapter 13 and 14. So next question, when did Paul write Galatians? Well, there's two major theories on the dating of Galatians. One is 47 to 49 AD, the other is 54 to 56. Again, if you're really curious about like more, learning more about that, text in a question to Q&R. I'll talk about it more there if you want. Uh, but personally, I'll just say I go with the earlier dating of Galatians. Now, the most important question of the morning, why? Start with why Simon Sinek said that. Like, why is a, it's an understanding question. It's an evaluation question. Why did Paul write Galatians? And our best guess for the why of Galatians is that the Apostle Paul is responding to a crisis. He's writing to a church that's just deeply fractured, divided, and experiencing conflict. And we actually can hear this all throughout the language of Galatians. Maybe you heard it a bit this morning. I I certainly, I hear it in the way that Paul is defending his apostleship or the way that Paul needs to remind the Galatians there is only one gospel or in the way that he has to address division between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, or in the way that he has to talk about the, the, the interaction between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. He's talking to a church that's seeking understanding and in conflict. But I think the heart of the reason why the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatians is actually found in a story he tells in chapter 2. In verse 11, it says, When Cephas, that's Peter, by the way, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belong to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Notice what's going on here. There there used to be one table when Peter was there. There used to be a table of unity and fellowship where they were one church. And all of a sudden, this circumcision group, these men from James, came and influenced that church, these agitators. And now the table of unity became the table of division. So why does Paul write Galatians? A divided table. And this is a like a huge deal in the ancient world, so much so that we don't always understand how big a deal this was. Because in the ancient world, who you eat with, who you share a table with, is who you love, who you accept. In the church, the table was the central place of worship. At the table was your brother and sister where you would break bread and receive the cup in remembrance of what Christ had done. But now in Galatians, the table is divided. And really, this becomes a huge symbol. This story here of a divided table becomes a symbol for every division in the church of Galatia. There's all sorts of tensions at play. And a a divided table points to all these tensions. So there are political tensions. There's theological tensions. There's ethnic tensions. There's sociological and relational tensions. All of this is working in the background of Galatians. And really, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter almost in a rush to announce that there's a better story than this. That the gospel actually breaks apart our divisions, our judgmentalism, our false religious systems. The gospel announces that we have a shared center. 
The gospel announces that in Christ we are one, that the table needs to be restored. And in the context of divisions and tensions, we need to remember in Christ we are one. So why does Galatians matter for us? I think it matters for our church and every church in the world right now because these are issues that are not far off from any of us. We live in very polarized and divisive times. We live in a time where there are so many forces trying to tear people apart. And it's in times like these that the church needs to relearn the deep lessons at the heart of this letter to the Galatians. We need to rediscover our shared center in Jesus. So that, friends, is where we're going for the next few weeks. And I hope you can join us in our journey through Galatians. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. What's the textual integrity of Galatians? How many times was it circulated? Do any copies of Galatians differ from each other? How can we tell it was Paul who wrote it? How do we know we can trust Paul? How do you like that for a Costco it. family pack of questions? So there's a whole series of questions in that, but basically that relates to the world of what we call textual criticism. Textual criticism is looking at ancient manuscripts and comparing them against each other. Of the New Testament, we have over 23,000 ancient manuscripts. It's more than any other contemporary source. So, for, for example, Homer's Odyssey had five. Five! And the New Testament has 23,000 fragments. So we have, we're quite confident in that. As far as how we know Paul wrote it, there's a whole study of like grammar, syntax, how people write. And as far as we can see, the grammar, the structure, really fits every other Pauline letter that we're absolutely kind of sure about. Um, certainly, the way I write, my wife can kind of pick it up. Those that study the Apostle Paul um, enough kind of get this sense of like, okay, this sounds like Paul. You know, the themes he talks about, like justification and, inc and inclusion, all of those come up in his writing in Galatians. And so you kind of like pay attention to the syntax and the grammar. Whereas like a different letter, like the Gospel of John, is actually written quite simply in the Greek. It's some of the simplest Greek writing we have. And yet, actually, I think it's one of the most profound of the Gospels. So th that's a little insight in there. For more, email me. Hopefully that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. I'm sure that um, there's a lot of intrigue around this because we've read the entire book of Galatians. It's mm -hmm. been a long time since we've done that, so this is really powerful. So, uh, next question. Thanks to the team to center the word in our service this week. The question is, the divided table. Churches have often divided the table around things that when we look back, we can't quite believe that we allowed these issues to divide us. How do we hold the unity that Jesus makes possible and live out in the issues that now threatens to divide us? How do we hold the openness that Jesus calls us to when we're upset and arguing about stuff here at TMP? I think part of this is having a radical commitment to Jesus as Lord. Because I think only when you have something in common can you bring people together. I think part of this too is like practices that we do together that actually bring people from different perspectives in the same building, in the same place. I think it's so interesting. I was chatting with a good friend of mine, John Hand, and he was talking about that there are people he goes to church with in his church that he's like, I would never be friends with these people outside of church. He actually said that, and I was like, tell me more. And he's like, yeah, like, they just, they don't have the same interests as me. And so much of our society is, is grouping people algorithmically. It's like, you like the Rolling Stones, therefore we can be friends. And it's very rare in our polarized age that we're actually finding unity, belonging, and, and friendship with people outside of our perspectives. Now, part of that is just the way that online engagement and social media has kind of geared us towards separation, that we only pay attention to certain news sites and certain people. We, we move apart. And I think uniquely, the church brings us together around a table where we can break bread and say, this is my brother, this is my sister. Hmm. Thanks, Paul. Today you talked about the why of Galatians. Often when you give a blessing at the end of a service, this is specifically to you, your practice, you say in ancient times, in ancient places, people who wanted to receive a blessing, etc. Hmm. Why do we look to ancient times and places for our practices today? 
Stanley Harwas, he's a, a, a theologian, and he has this brilliant line. He says, we don't get to make it up. Christianity is a received faith. And I think that's why we look to ancient times and ancient practices, is that we are part of a story. Your grandma probably prayed prayers for you. Your great-grandma, your great-great-great-great-grandma, imagine just praying for all the generations. And I think uniquely in our age of individualism, that's a tough concept for us to get. So we almost think like we have to reinvent the wheel every time. And what that ultimately does is it, one, it creates a lot of restlessness, but it, it has a failure to receive the good things that we can. I'm not saying that we have an un, uh, sort of like filtered acceptance of everything that's come down the line. But if there is a gift, would you be so bold to open it, to receive it? I think there's so much that we can receive from past generations. And it's often, I think, it's often the case that we think that people that came before us have nothing to offer. I think they have much to offer us. They also were anxious. They also had doubts. They also struggled to love and receive love. And maybe they have something to teach us. I think you could say the same in our current context of like, Bob, can I, can I pick on you a bit? Go ahead. Okay. So Bob, how old are you? <laughs> I am 60 years old and I'm proud. Okay. So you would be, there's a millennial term for, for, for what you are. Are you aware of this term? Go ahead, lay it on us. <laughs> it's called boomer. <laughs> yep. Wouldn't it kind of be like really weird if I thought you had nothing to offer me? Hmm. Yeah, what if you, you did? I'd be very disappointed. Yeah. yeah, I think you have much to offer. Yeah. And actually, I, I think that's probably something my generation needs to learn a bit is that we think that the generations that came before us only ever got it wrong. I think they are human, but you still have gifts to offer, Mm -hmm. so. Great. Well, do you want to do one of those ancient times and ancient places? I I thought I was actually going to change it today, but now I feel like I have to. (laughs) Hey, why don't you stand with me? I'm actually in a, so yeah, in ancient times and in ancient places. Uh, yes, but I was actually going to change it for 2024. What we're going to do, at least in, in the way I would like to close in our gatherings in 2024, is I want to invite you to adopt three physical postures, and they go as such. First, take your right hand and put it on your heart. Then, stretch out your hands and put them down. This is called palms down. And then, just turn your palms up. Those are the three postures. So let's get into this. Hand on the heart. Brothers and sisters, gathered in the presence of God, know that you are loved, that your heart as it beats, beats to the rhythm of your creator who knows you, who loves you, that you no longer live, but in Christ you live. You are loved. I invite you to stretch out your hands, palms down. So as you leave this place today, would you let go of every worry? Would you let go of every tension? Would you let go of every burden that you are carrying today? I invite you to take your palms and face them up. And today, brothers and sisters, would you receive all that God has for you? That as you leave this place today, you would know God's encouragement, that you would know his love, that you would know his grace and mercy, which is new every morning. Receive it in your body today. I send you out with the last verse of Galatians. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Everybody said, amen. Amen. See you next week.